Thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you to future YouTube people for watching. Um, yeah, so today I'll talk about how our, our social relationships affect not only just how our bodies kind of function on a daily basis, but also our kind of long-term health outcomes. And so the way I like to explain this to people is to start by kind of summarizing this, what's now quite a large body of literature um, that involves these longitudinal studies. So researchers will follow people around, uh, ask them questions about um, their, their lifestyle, so maybe the type of job they have, their income, um, their diet, things like this, how much exercise they get. They follow them for, for years, sometimes decades, and they, they sort of track how often they get sick uh, and eventually when they pass away. Um, and what these studies have shown time and time again, it was initially kind of a, like a surprise finding, and now it's quite common, is that our social lives are very important for our sort of long-term health outcomes. Uh, and just to give you an example, they're kind of like on par with smoking cigarettes, actually. So a person who is in the 90th percentile of what, what we say loneliness, so these people are kind of lacking uh, support from their social relationships. So a person in the 90th percentile of loneliness is as at risk for death and disease as a person in the 90th percentile of cigarette smoking. So that's like something like 15 cigarettes a day. So we can have like really intense effects uh, on, on death and disease uh, from our, our social relationships. And so why is this the case? And so we like to take a kind of an evolutionary perspective in uh, explaining these effects. Uh, and so if you look at um, the animal kingdom, uh, you'll, you'll notice that many uh, social species um, suffer from social isolation. Uh, so everything from fruit flies to, to rodents to, to non-human primates um, will get sick more often and die sooner when, um, when they're socially isolated. And so why is this the case? Uh, it's because of the way uh, organisms have evolved to respond to social isolation uh, and what social isolation cues to these organisms. So, um, and it's especially true for social, social species. So uh, for, for social species such as a rodent, uh, social isolation probably means increased risk of predation. Um, and then in humans, we have these effects are really magnified because not only are we uh, dependent on our social relationships for safety, um, but you know, as what, what some researchers have called the ultra-social species, we rely upon our social relationships for many more things. So we evolved to live in quite small, uh, tightly knit social groups where we would get everything from food and safety and shelter from our social relationships. And so they were uh, incredibly important, and not, not just for these things, but for sort of for the cultural information we need to survive in a given environment. These are all mediated via our social relationships. So we would expect humans to have like a very um, strong response to the social cues that we're getting, because this would have been very important for the survival and reproduction of our ancestors. And so this is kind of like the basic currencies of, um, of natural selection. Uh, and so what we see is that we have evolved to respond to the sort of potential danger and potential uh, resource scarcity of social isolation in, in a few different particular ways. And so uh, many social species will show increased, um, increased stress response, so the fight or flight response when socially isolated. Uh, and in humans, we also see like increases in uh, fatigue, lethargy, like uh, lower levels of energy. And so what these things are doing is uh, preparing the body to deal with the, the consequences of social isolation, what would have been associated with social isolation in our evolutionary past. So things like uh, physical danger, that's the stress response, fight or flight response, and lack of resources. This is sort of our conservation mode, getting tired, feeling more, more uh, or feeling less energized. Um, and so these are adaptive in the short term, right? They help us survive or would have helped us survive uh, the, the difficulties of social isolation. Um, but when they're experienced chronically, so things like when stress is experienced chronically or fatigue is experienced chronically, they can have negative long-term health consequences. So, um, for example, chronic stress can lead to increased blood pressure, heart disease, even diabetes. So a lot of the things that um, are related to, to, to socially isolated people getting, getting sick uh, and dying sooner can be explained by these effects. Um, and so what it, what's happening is that there's kind of this trade-off, right? And our, um, our social relationships can help mitigate the, the need for these short-term responses that can have long-term effects when chronically activated. Uh, and so given our sort of evolutionary history of interdependence and the importance of social relationships uh, during human evolution, um, some researchers have, have proposed this thing called social baseline theory, which is sort of saying that 
uh, human relationship or humans uh, view our social relationships uh, as bioenergetic resources. So they're actually a, a, the presence of our of these relationships are cues to resources. Uh, and so we'll see things like a drop in body temperature or increased cravings for high calorie foods when we're socially isolated. And some research has even shown that we perceive hills to be steeper when we're on our own versus with uh, our friends. And so things can be, uh, so, so, so people have sort of um, suggested that uh, human cognition and, and physiological processes are like automatically embedded within our social worlds and that these, these um, systems take into account uh, our, our, our social lives when, when responding to, to different situations. And so that's kind of like the, the backdrop to our research uh, and I say our, I, I work a lot with Emma Cohen, who is my PhD supervisor, now my boss. Uh, she's also a fellow here at Wadham. Um, and what we have become interested in is energetic trade-offs. And so for any uh, organism, uh, uh, how it uses energy is crucial to, to, to how it survives, right? Uh, and so we were quite interested in how social cues affect energy trade-offs in humans. Uh, and surprisingly, despite all the, the sort of the research that I've summarized today, uh, in this talk, um, there wasn't a lot of work uh, looking at how social cues can affect the kind of behavioral and metabolic processes that underpin uh, energy use in humans. Uh, and so we thought an interesting way to kind of study this would be through physical exercise. Of course, people like do, like, they use a lot of energy during physical exercise, so it's good for that. But it's also like quite anthropologically relevant. People do exercise across cultures in different forms, not just at the gym, but you know, maybe working uh, outside or in their jobs or whatever, right? So there's many ways that people can do exercise. Uh, and so I'll just kind of briefly talk about some of the, the work we've done. Um, so experimentally, we like to manipulate people's perceptions of social support, we call it, uh, or, or sort of cohesion. So we, we've worked with sports teams, so the Oxford University rugby team, for example, and we would manipulate their kind of perceptions of group cohesion by manipulating their, their group warm-up that they did before a, a difficult running task. Or in some experiments, we might show the face of a loved one versus the face of a stranger and see how people respond while doing different types of exercise, everything from like hand grip, hand grip studies to, to rowing. Um, and what we found is that when we give people these cues to group cohesion or support, uh, they're able to exercise like longer or, or harder, so, so they're able to exercise more. Um, and we've even had people wear uh, like, a, like a face mask to measure oxygen consumption as a proxy for energy, energy expenditure, and we found that these uh, greater exercise outputs are underpinned by actually just more energy uh, consumption, right? So the body's using more energy. And what happens is like the, it seems that although people say they're trying equally hard in both conditions, their sort of perceptions of fatigue develop a bit later when they feel socially supported. And so fatigue is an important thing because it, it evolved to protect us um, from overexerting ourselves, from using too much energy. And so it seems that when we get these social cues that we're safe and the exercise is safe and that we'll be able to replenish our, um, the resources that we've used, that the sort of protective breaks of fatigue are eased a bit and people are able to do a bit more physical activity. Um, so we've also looked at this kind of in the real world. So um, we've looked at this thing called Park Run, which is like a five kilometer run that happens all across the UK uh, every Saturday. And we followed park runners, is what, they're, what they, they are called, um, for three months, um, asking them all kinds of questions about like their social sociality at Park Run. So, you know, were they social with their friends before their run? Did they feel included in the, in the community that is Park Run? All these sorts of things. Um, and what we found is that when people feel supported and included in this park run community, they actually run faster run times. And they, they, they say that they feel more energized. And this is what, this is what allows them to like kind of run faster run times. And other studies have shown that these sorts of feelings of increased energy and inclusion also just cause people to, to go exercise more. So they, they attended park run more, so things like this. Um, so that kind of leads to my next, the next bit of research that I'm interested in. Um, and that is kind of how these energetic trade-offs work in daily life. So not just like in a sports team or exercise context, but just like, like what makes my mom like walk a bit further to the grocery store or go on like a longer walk. Um, she's probably gonna watch this on YouTube. So <laughs> thank you for letting me use her as an example. Use you as an example. Um, so basically the way we look at this in, in, in daily life is through kind of some observational studies. So, um, there's one cool database called the European Social Survey, which like asks people, like 40,000 Europeans, a bunch of different questions about their life. Uh, we were interested in a, a few uh, particular ones, so how much pain they felt, how much fatigue they felt, and, and their levels of de reported depression. 
Um, and so these are kind of what we call a symptom cluster. So pain, fatigue, and depression uh, often co-occur within individuals, and they can, if you have one, it can cause you to have the others, right? Um, and so we were interested in how this was predicted, not just by loneliness, it's one of the variables, but also by people's income. Um, so an important thing to consider when we think about income is, the effects, is that the effects of poverty are oftentimes quite similar uh, physiologically uh, to the effects of, of social isolation. So people who are living in poverty, who, are, who, who may feel that they have low social status, um, will have higher levels of uh, like chronic stress, uh, higher levels of chronic fatigue, and these can actually lead to, to long-term health consequences. So uh, the sort of social cues people get in terms of their social standing can affect um, their physiology. Uh, and there's a really interesting book that the human sciences students are reading at the moment called Weathering, um, which I highly recommend by Arlene uh, Geronimus. Um, and this sort of explains how these, these processes happen in, uh, with regard to poverty. Uh, so back to our own research, uh, we, we found through this in this um, observational data set that chronic pain, chronic fatigue, and um, depression were predicted by both uh, poverty and social isolation, uh, loneliness but that there was an interaction such that the, the effects of poverty, so the negative effects of poverty on these things, so increasing pain, fatigue, and depression were strongest in individuals who had low levels of perceived support, so who were especially lonely, which would potentially suggest that social support is especially important for people who are like dealing with the many difficulties of living uh, in poverty. And this is especially concerning given that humans, we're, we're like a meaning-making species, right? So we, not only do we, do we feel supported by our daily interactions, but we also get meaning from the social group that we perceive ourselves to be a part of and, and our social standing within that group and how we view what that group can, can help us do in terms of living life uh, to its fullest and thriving. Um, and so what's concerning is that over the past uh, four or five decades, there's been a slow erosion of the social fabric of many like working class communities. So things that used to give people a place uh, like meaning and belonging, such as labor unions or, or social clubs, our uh, membership is declining. And we also see like shifts in the economy to um, sort of gig economy work and, and zero hour contracts, which, which can take away people's sort of uh, feelings of belonging in the workplace, feelings of support from the people they work with. Um, and of course, as I've, as I've kind of argued, I think this probably can have negative effects on how their bodies are, are responding to, to the daily uh, stresses of life. Um, and so that's kind of where I want to end the talk. Uh, just thinking about this idea that disparities in health outcomes, uh, they exist for many reasons. Of course, we have disparities in access to health care, disparities in health behaviors, and these are important. There's a lot of work to be done just in that area, but we also need to consider how, um, how our social relationships and how people's sense of, of, of belonging uh, in, in, a, in a society can affect their physiology and ultimately their health outcomes. So this is just something to think of in our daily life, even with people, your family members or friends that how you treat them, your, your social relationships with them can actually have health consequences for them. Uh, and when we think about the sort of public policies we advocate, advocate for or the politicians we advocate for, I would argue that if you're interested in creating a, like a society where uh, people have a chance to have good health outcomes, we have to consider uh, the types of policies that, um, that give us institutions that help us build social relationships and, and give people a, a place, uh, a sense of belonging within society, not just people who are doing well financially, but, but all people. And that through this, uh, we'll, be, we'll be able to reach the, the sort of best health outcomes for everybody. So with that, I'll end uh, and take some questions.